All right, so uh, welcome to the Dana Cortez Show. Today, we are so excited. We have a conversation we're calling United for Justice, a day of discussion. And uh, obviously, me, Dana Cortez, DJ Automatic, and Anthony are hosting this conversation. We're going to welcome our guests. We have Jackie Summers. We have Dr. Lorraine Warren, also AJ Ali. So thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I want to start with Jackie Summers. He's an author. He's a public speaker, founder of Jack from Brooklyn, Inc. Now, you know, interestingly enough, as I'm looking at, at your resume, as I'm looking everything up, you've been writing, Mr. Summers, for over a decade about yeah. racism. And yeah. we can tell, you know, we can talk about the history of racism in America. We can go back not only 400 years, um, you know, a thousand years. We can go back a long time from, you know, on, uh, on the history of racism, racism in this country. But there seems to be, in the past decade, I've noticed a more, I feel like a boldness to racism. Even certain media outlets feel comfortable um, with talk that makes me very uncomfortable. Where do you think that this comes from? Even, I, I mean, I hate to say this, but I even sense that at certain times when they're speaking, there seems to be a sense of pride in the way they're talking. Where do you think this comes from? And not only that, what kind of change do you want to see, not only in reforming police, but also when we talk about equality in schools, we talk about equality in the workplace, and also in media? The boldness comes, obviously, because folks are emboldened by the politicians, and that does not start with the idiot in charge at the moment. I think a real change happened in my lifetime, personally, when Reagan took over. You saw all of the public programs start to be defunded, and those funds were redirected toward police. He very much picked up on Nixon's cues and ran on this whole law and order thing. And unfortunately, Clinton picked up on it, too. Uh, it has been a dog whistle for years. Fear people who don't look like you because they're trying to take from you. Uh, and we can protect them from you. And it's gotten bolder and bolder in the last 30 years to the point where we are now, where cops can literally look in a camera and know they're being filmed and smirk as they murder. So yeah, I think it's about time we've had enough. I think it's about time for change. But as far as I'm concerned, this little tippy top change, little itty bitty change, the whole system was designed designed from the get-go to suppress and oppress black people. Listen, I'm perfectly fine with bringing the whole thing down and starting up something brand new and fresh, personally. How do you, how do you think that we can go about that? Some people say that's a radical idea. Some people say there's no way to do that. I there's mean, always a way <laughs> to make something happen. Idea, but those people have to understand that those ideas existed before this country did. If you go back to the people, like I'm Caribbean, so that means I'm part Native American and I'm part captured African slave. All of my people had, had organizations of, of, of order that didn't involve police. The police in this country were specifically came from a group of people who were designed to round up runaway slaves. Landowners and plantation owners had local sheriffs that would round up slaves and when they got tired of having to pay them, they convinced lo local governments to make it a tax funded thing. That's where we get police departments from. They, I mean, they were designed to protect and serve, but not, not humans, they were designed to protect and serve landowners and land. And as far as I'm concerned, we can go back to how things were before everyone was colonized. We, we, we did this before, we can do it again. I'm so glad that you, go ahead Otto, I'm sorry. Uh, do you believe in do you believe defunding the police departments is the first step? I think I think we can absolutely change where funds go, and it's I, I want to be real clear about this. When we talk about defunding police departments, we have to take into account that hundreds of millions of dollars were diverted away from social programs in the last thirty years toward police departments. We can actually take the money that militarized the police and demilitarize them and put those back into the social social programs that actually reduce crime. It's interesting that you go back as far as Reagan, and I'm glad you do. And, and, and like you said, and also the history of police itself and why police exist today. And you also talk about the native aspect. You talk about that. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years of racism before American slavery even. That, your history speaks on that. But 
when you talk about the social programs, that hits me at home. My grandmother was a diagnosed schizophrenic. And during that time, during the Reagan era, there was no longer any help for a family like mine that had no means, uh, no medical insurance. There was nothing at all we could do. And you see, the, you see what happened because of that. The streets are filled with people that are ill, that are mentally ill and have nowhere to go. Yet someone will call the police on them because there's nowhere else for them to turn to. When in reality, it, they're sick. You would never call the police on a cancer patient. But we call police on people with mental illness because what else, are we, what else do people do? If they see someone who might hurt themselves or hurt someone else because of mental illness, we call police because we don't have anywhere to take them. There's no more state you know, hospitals. There's nothing for people to rely on. So what defunding police means isn't taking all their money away. It's reallocating the money to resources, to helping communities that are impoverished, specifically black and brown communities. Let's be real. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. Because systemically, these are the communities that have been forced into this poverty, and that money has gone completely to police and, and really to incarcerate people. Put them in jail because the prisons make money. True, true. The prisons are, are, are for profit. Um, what about your writing? Just talk a little bit about that. 10 years, why do you write? More than, I mean, more, I was trying to read everything. I was like, I can't, I don't have okay, enough I mean, time. I, I mean, I, the, the short version of the story is I launched a liquor company about 10 years ago. When I got my liquor license in 2012, I found out I was the only black person in America with a license to make liquor at the time. It was just me. That's, so that means even though my brand was good, every single time I went in, into a restaurant or a bar to, to sell my wares, they had no lived experience with a black liquor brand owner. And it so happened that the year I launched my brand was the year Trayvon Martin was killed. And I ran into the problem of actually having to do business as a new business owner or deal with people who were being overtly racist. And it was like, well, I need to make money, but can I curse? Yes, you can curse. Racists. So, so, so for me, it was, it was a question. A, uh, I personally can choose money or integrity. I can make more money. I can't make more integrity. I started to write specifically for the purpose of educating my industry about racism. And the interesting thing about that work, teaching people how, teaching people about racism, is you can't teach people that you can't be racist. It's not enough because the system is racist. You must teach anti-racism because everyone benefits passively from a system that is racist. And when I started to teach that, I had a revelation. I thought to myself, I don't think of myself as sexist, but am I actually anti-sexist? Right. Am I benefiting passively from patriarchy? Yes, I am. So what can I do to start to unlearn the culture of sexism I was raised in? And how can I learn to be actively anti-sexist? And once you have that revelation, all of the holes open up and you go, where else have my blind spots been? How can I be actively anti-ableism? How can I be actively anti-ageism? How can I be actively anti-oppression? I love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much. Now we're going to talk to Dr. Lorraine Warren. Um, she is, I, I read about you last night and I'm so incredibly proud to have you on. You, you studied, worked, and traveled to over 100 countries to educate law enforcement entities and cultural cultural competency and leadership. Now you partner with Legacy International. It's a peace building organization. Um, Dr. Warren, I read you talk to children from all over the world, from Yemen, Iraq, as well as the US. You also speak to children from Native American reservations. And we hosted a conversation last week very similar to this one. And one of the things that struck me from a very young man is um, he's a teacher. Uh, his fear of police, he's just, his whole life, he's just had this internal fear of police. And I, and I told him, I said, you know, that's trauma. You've had to live with trauma your entire life. How are people expected to live with the effects of trauma daily? And why is this something that we don't discuss more in, in this country and really all over? 
Well, you know, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. You know, we do live with it. You say, how are we expected to live with it? We do live with it. I mean, I've lived with it. You know, I remember being in um, grade school and we would walk down the street. And you know, it's in that adolescent phase when you're starting to develop as a young woman. And right. um, a couple of piece, police officers would be saying stuff to the girls. I mean, we felt very uncomfortable. And I was raised in an environment where we had the concept of officer friendly. That's the person you go to when you're in trouble. But yet, as I um, grew older, I saw something different. Mm -hmm. And so then that, for me, was the beginning of the mistrust. So if you could imagine, you know, I've, I've worked with hundreds of thousands of young people who their exper experience of the police is stop and frisk. I worked in New York where I was doing a training um, after school and the young people, um, this one young guy, he came on time every day. And one day he was late. I was like, what's going on? Why are you late? And he said, oh, I just had to deal with something. It's no big deal. But I, I was like, I pressed him, why are you late? And he said, the police stopped him. And he said, they do it all the time. They stop us, they put us in lineups. They don't call our parents. And then sometimes they give us um, $25 to just go home and let it go. And I was outraged. And so some parents got together and they put a stop to that particular neighborhood where that was happening. But what was striking about the whole story was how casual he was about it. Like, you know, it happens, big deal. And actually, he didn't experience, he didn't uh, respond emotionally until he saw me respond emotionally, until he saw my upset. So if you ask how we expect it to deal with it, it in the African American, people of Black African descent, we are strong. We are survivors. We are resilient. And there's a cost to that. There's an impact. Most of the young people that I've talked to who, you know, have been in those kind of situations, who are trying to go to school to educate themselves, start businesses, just trying to just be a young person. Some of them, if you heard their story, it would be like, oh my God, I have so much respect for young people, especially the ones who are going through that trauma and still waking up every day, getting out of bed, going to school, doing something. Because when I hear some of their stories, I think, I don't know how I would get up in the morning. And they do. So what when is, you talk to is, that many when so when you talk to that many kids and you know, you said like you said, literally thousands of different kids, is there one story in particular that really stands out to you that like really was the one that was probably the worst? I don't know if I could tell you that one. <laughs> 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 oh, wow. You know, we, the one thing we want you to know is you don't have to talk about who it is or anything. We certainly don't want you to say any names, mm -hmm. but there might be somebody listening who's a parent. Yeah. There um, might be a child listening who doesn't know how to deal with this. And there's something you said that struck me. You said he was unable to release his emotion until you allowed him that until you expressed concern and love in turn he felt like okay it's okay for me to hurt it's okay for me to feel pain it's okay for me to say i'm uncomfortable and this hurts me that holding on to that yeah sometimes later in life i know i did it you can let it out and it can hurt you in a way that i mean i could have ended up in jail i could there could have been a lot of things that happened and these young men who are already taught, don't cry, don't act this way, you gotta be a man. For them to not have that release, it can even go worse for them. What would you advise parents or children who are listening who don't feel like they could release that emotion? They don't have someone that they feel like they could talk to. And sometimes parents are afraid to talk to their own kids. Well, you know- Dr. Warren? I want to go back to your question about what is the main story, but I'll, I'll go to this one first. 
one thing um, out of working with so many young people, I can tell when a young person is loved by how they walk, by how, how they hold themselves, by how they express. And so what I would say to a parent is love your child. Don't let the first thing that come out of your mouth be a criticism because they feel it, even the little thing. You might be doing it as, a self, as, as to correct them or because you want the best of them, but reframe it into a positive. Tell them what they're doing right, and then that will expand. Keep as much as you can, acknowledge them like, oh, wow, I love the way you put that jacket and those pants together. I love the way <laughs> you said that. Oh, that was so nice that you held the door for that um, lady. You know, that's the kind of young man I love to see. You know, you're great. You have great ideas. What are your ideas? You're so creative. You you have a talent in art. I love the way you exp like anything that you could do to build them up and express it because because I've also worked in communities where that's all the children get. They get acknowledged, they get affirmed, and they just walk with such pride and therefore that's what they give to the world. Their love, their pride, their joy. I want to go back to that question about, I don't think that it was like one worst thing, but what I've heard when I've worked, and I'm specific, specifically dealing with um, communities where the children are living in a state of trauma. Right. And uh, I used, I, I was a course leader for an organization called New York Youth at Risk. It's now yeah. called Unlocking Futures. In the first part of the program, we would have all of the young people in the room and we would ask them, what do you, where do you see yourself five years from now? And the thing that broke my heart is most of the young people would say, I'm not going to be alive five years from now. I'm going to be dead. Oh my God. For a 14 year old, a 16 year old to say that's their future. And so we would have to get, create another possibility for them, to have them see another possibility for themselves. And then the next part of the program, we would take them to the woods, to the cabins, so they could breathe the air, so they could breathe the trees and just be. And then ask them, what's your story? And once they were able to release that story and to say, like all of their trauma, some of them, what happened to them when they were two, three, in a safe space, then they had the freedom to make some different choices. But and then after that, they had to get support. So when I see the young people walking around and they're doing what they do, I don't necessarily automatically judge it. I want to know what's your story. And if I could get to a place where they're willing to share that, then we could, we could get somewhere. And, on the other, and I just want to say on the other side of the coin, the young people who are doing well, they're excelling in school. Sometimes we don't give them love and attention because you know, they're okay, they're doing fine. But those young people need attention and love too because they can come to a place when it's just like, oh, do I have to do something bad in order to get attention? And another thing, I just want to say that there are a lot of young people who are doing amazing, awesome, outstanding things for this world. And we need to build them up too. So. I, I love that you said that. We, uh, we talk to a lot of young people on a daily basis. They feel, they feel like they can trust us. We even have a segment called the parent. Parents court. We call parents and we tell them, hey, your child is having a problem. Can we discuss it? Can we all come to, to terms with it, you know, uh, with an audience? And uh, one of the things that I think is important when you talk to kids is teaching them they're important. Now, that doesn't mean they're above all. They, they can't be corrected. Because I always tell my, my daughters, you know, I love you unconditionally. I may not love everything you do, but I love you unconditionally. And you can always come to me with a question. But that advice struck me too, because I, uh, I find myself being highly critical of my own children at times, because I, want, I don't want them to do what I did. I don't want them, I want them to have more than I had. 
I came up from humble beginnings. I didn't have anything. So I want to give them everything. But yeah. that in itself, they don't really need presence as much as they need us to be present, you know, and attentive and loving. I think that's such a beautiful message to share with families. Well, I have a project. Um, it's called, Cre I'll show you the button. It's called Creating a World That Listens. And I, um, it came out of a dream I had. And I just, and in the dream, I was to set up chairs and go to public places and just listen to people. And I've listened to young people, all people from all walks of life, all races. And I, this one woman who participated, she said that she was so impacted that she went and she purchased red chairs and she put them in her house. And she told her children that when they sat in that chair, her promise was she was gonna listen to them. Oh my gosh. And so I think in the midst of all of it, in the midst of all of this, we gotta listen. You know, we have to listen to the people that we don't necessarily like what they say or wanna hear what they say, because there's always a surface story and then there's a story behind the story that needs to be listened to. And then you listen, and then you see what actions there are to take and take inspired action. Because it's not just about listening, it's about hearing and then out of the listening, okay, what am I seeing to do? If I watch your film, it, how can anyone watch that film walking while black and not hear something? And say, okay. And want, and want a solution to, to, to the problem. Right. It is, you're right, venting is important, expressing that emotion. but people need solutions or the cycle exactly. continues. Right. And I'm glad, I'm glad you brought up the film, Dr. Warren. Thank you so much. Um, AJ Ali, award-winning filmmaker, uh, Walking While Black. You're right, watching that is so powerful. Um, Love is the Answer, it authored a book by the same title. You know, we watched the film and I was mesmerized by each story. But something else that struck me about your work was I believe you wrote somewhere, you had radical solutions for police reform and ending systemic racism. So before I ask the question, I recently saw an interview with civil rights activist, Bob Woodson. Now he said, and, I, and I'm gonna quote him because I don't wanna get this wrong. I don't know what systemic racism is. Maybe someone can explain what it means. So what I would like you to do is explain to Mr. Woodson and anyone who doubts the existence of systemic racism, what it means, and please break down your radical solutions for police reform. Sure, thanks for uh, having me on. I've just enjoyed listening to, uh, to everyone. Uh, Jackie and Rain, you're brilliant, and uh, the world is a better- They really are. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, systemic racism is a lot like a knee on the back of your throat. When you're black in America or brown in America and you try to do good, you try to uh, build a life for yourself and your family, build a business, go to school, uh, be part of the American dream, there are always hurdles placed in your way. Uh, some of them are uh, not done maliciously, you know, those microaggressions that we face. Mm -hmm. um, others are done just outright uh, racist. And systemic oppression, systemic racism, it takes its form in, in many, many ways. It would take us two hours to just scratch the surface. But it is a lot like that, that knee on the back of the neck where every time you try to take a breath, every time you try to move, every time, time you do something, there are systemic forces that are holding you back. We've seen it with redlining uh, laws where you couldn't even buy a home in a, in a neighborhood. Or if you were Thank you. in a neighborhood and you wanted to leave that neighborhood to go to work, you were questioned every time you, you, you tried to even go to work to make a living. Uh, we see it in, in the form of uh, the boardrooms of America. Where are black people in the boardroom? You know, I spent a lot of time in the golf industry. I can't name one black person I ever saw on the wall of a country club uh, where it was uh, the board of directors. And, and six or seven times when I would go to produce a, 
a celebrity golf event that was raising a ton of money for charity, uh, I would be met with comments at the, at the front door before they knew who I was, like deliveries are around back. They mm. said in the 50s, I'm not that old. I'm talking about the 2000s, right? So I'm there to run the show. And I'm being told deliveries are around back in the 2000s. Like I said, we could go on and on for hours about that, but it, it, it is affecting black men and women, brown men, men and women, literally every step they take to live out the American dream. And that's gotta stop. What is the idea of radical solutions for police reform? And why did you use the word radical? <laughs> because I thought, that was, is, I thought that was brilliant, yeah. by the way, but go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, because love is radical, because a lot of people don't think that love can solve a whole lot. But um, those very same people are here because of love. They've been loved in, in their life. And, and so when I talk about love is the answer, I don't just talk about a warm and fuzzy, cuddly kind of love. <laughs> I talk about the most powerful force in the universe. I talk about the love that Nelson Mandela had for his people. I talk about the love that Martin Luther King Jr. had for everyone. You know, I talk about it from a perspective of, it's best broken down in a pledge that we created that people can, can take and, and, and live it out. I, I, I pledge to learn. The L is for learn. I pledge to learn about the people in my community, to unconditionally open my heart to their needs as if they were all immediate family members to volunteer, to be part of the solution in their life during both good and challenging times, and to empower everyone I meet to do the same as if our lives depended on each other. L-O-V-E is four action steps that people can take. And if they take them, I I've seen the results. This isn't just a, a theory. We've put this into action all over the country more than 35,000 people have seen our film, Walking While Black, Love is the Answer. People are reading the books. Uh, but more importantly, people are putting things into action. I say watch the film, read the book, and put love into action. And when you do those steps, those action steps, you, you, you make love into an action verb. You know, and it's powerful. I've seen six foot two muscle-bound police officers who hated the community <laughs> they serve come up to me with tears in their eyes after a screening of the film, saying that they needed to make things happen to change the way their police department does business. And that some of the very same screenings I've seen young people, young black and brown children come up to me with tears in their eyes, saying I've hated police my entire life because of the things I've seen, things I've experienced. But these two hours have changed my life. And now I might even want to become a police officer so that I can put love into action in the community so I can yes. make a difference and change the system from within. So that love that I'm talking about is powerful. It's the one that can break down walls and barriers and it can bring people uh, together. I want to encourage parents and children to watch the film. I'm glad that you mentioned that children watch it because I don't want anyone to think that it's not something that your children yeah, should watch. I had a should, question for watch. Jackie. Sure, go ahead. Jackie, I wanted to ask you something because there's just something that's just I'm mulling in my mind right now about your comments of teaching anti-racism. And I'm, I'm a Hispanic man from Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is a minority majority state and it's all Hispanics. And I find myself dealing with quote unquote Hispanics who feel that the Black Lives Matter movement doesn't represent them or their oppression as well. To a person like that, Jackie, what would you tell them with your approach of teaching anti-racism versus what I've been doing is just showing them facts of how they're wrong. And now <laughs> I'm them, I might just be perpetuating something else because your method seems a lot more peaceful. And I just, I just want to ask you that, what would you tell those Hispanics who feel that the movement isn't representing their oppression? I think it's important to note that blackness in the United States was always specifically used to define what was not white. And that, that is what I think a lot of people who are not black, but are not white seem to pass by. Uh, if you were to look at the education court, the education case that actually got integration in schools, it didn't start over a black kid, it started over an Asian kid. There was an Asian kid that tried to 
to join a charter school and the school told them no. And when the parents asked why not, they said she's not black and they went, yeah, but she's not white either. And that's why we've seen whiteness expand over the course of the years. If you look far back enough, Hispanic people were considered white in this country. And if we're gonna be completely honest, there's a significant amount of either Dominican, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Colombian, Venezuelan, Brazilian, Latinos who, who are white passing. But as soon as it becomes inconvenient, you will be considered other. And this is why I try to tell people, the reason you get behind Black Lives Matter is because Black people in this country haven't fought for Black lives. They fought for everyone. When the Civil Rights Act was passed in the 1960s, it wasn't the Black Civil Rights Act. It was, the, let's get rights for everybody. And if you ever start to wonder just how close you are to being treated like a Black person, go protest. Hmm. Go protest, and then you'll see the only purpose of having blackness in this country is to separate it from whiteness. If it becomes convenient, sure, they'll continue to expand what the definition of whiteness is. But the, the point is always to keep a separation between the, like you said, the majority of us and those who want to, ma who want to maintain control. And we're seeing very clearly right now, right now, if you look in the streets, maintaining control over, over people is more important for mm. to to make to 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 to, to keeping power than than the color of your skin and b again black people fought for everyone's rights if you get behind black lives matter you're fighting for your own rights in the end end of story uh, you know uh, jackie you just said something and i'll go back to what aj ali said too you mentioned redlining nobody talks about redlining uh you mentioned white passing i'm a very light skinned latina so i'm mexicana i'm mexican but let me tell you something where my family grew up we were subject to Jim Crow. It didn't matter. We were subject to that. It didn't matter. And the history is Crow. what they, they don't care. Let me tell you, Latinos don't really have a history. We were talking about this. Our history has pretty much been erased. Nobody yeah. talks about the Repatriation Act where a million American citizens were deported because of their ancestry. Nobody talks about it. It's not, you don't read that in books. You know, so a part of what I think Anthony, your friends don't understand is they don't even know who they are. They don't even know where they come from. And that's, that's such a great thing. The redlining situation, that's why when I mentioned black and brown communities, we were all put in a certain area of the city. We couldn't buy outside. We didn't qualify for loans. And that's where you stay. This is what you're worth. This is all there is for you. And that's it. And that's why Black Lives, lives Matters matters to all of us. The civil rights, you're right, civil rights was about everybody, but for Latinos, if there was any kind of language barrier, we couldn't even vote till the mid 70s. So, you know, we don't even know our own history. So until we really start to understand that, I think that it, it's a bigger conversation and we need to come together. There's a, there's a serious reason why we have been pitted against each other because together we're a very powerful entity. And that's why we got to continue having this conversation. <laughs> so I, I think it's important that people know, like, if you get behind Black Lives Matter, the understanding is that Black people are the canary in the coal mine. Black people are the test for, the litmus test for what kind of oppression you will stand for. And the whole point is, is as soon as you start to stand for them, it's like, well, now we need to oppress more people because they didn't get it. If you solve the problems of the Black community, you'll solve the problems of America period, end of story. If you address, like you said, things like redlining, education, food poverty, all, all that stuff is deliberate, homelessness, mental health issues. If you address those for the black community again, because we've always been the test. We've always been the canary in the coal mine. Solve those problems, you fix the whole country. I love it. You got everyone. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, Jackie, Jackie Summers, all your writings. People, please Google. The man, the man has got some incredible articles. We also have Dr. Lorraine Warren. I think that the empathy that you spoke about is going to help a lot of people, kids, families, mothers, fathers, and AJ Ali, your work is beautiful. It is a must watch film. Wa Walking Wall Black, Love is the Answer. Please have everybody in your family watch it. Can we do this again? 
because I'm not about just hashtag when we need to do this again and oh, continue yeah. this conversation regularly, please. I'm in. I'm in. All right. We love next you. Time we're on, though, you. you know, next time we're on, I want to get uh, Melvin on because that guy, he made such an impact <laughs> on me. He was like, if we could have a hundred of him in every single city. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll make that happen. And by the way, th there are a hundred of them, but they don't get the voice. And the mass media generally does not want to report on that, but they are there. Trust me. We just need to give them a, a bigger megaphone uh, so that people can know it and work with them to create change in their communities. Thank you guys so much. Lucy Boss, I love it. Wish you all love and light, and we'll, we'll talk again sooner than later. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peace.